We, we drive the kids 20 minutes to school. It's 20 minutes each way to get the kids to school. But that's because the, the speed limit here is 35 miles an hour. <laughs> so, oh, I bet that's enforced, too. I bet that's enforced pretty hard. Eh, oh, really? I mean, it's, it's not, but the roads are small. And, like, look, man, when everybody's going 35 miles an hour, it's, a, it's two lanes in either direction. When everybody's going 35 miles an hour and there's stop signs and stuff, and somebody then starts going 50, it's pretty noticeable. And when you're that guy, you're like, oh, I'm going way too fast right now. Yeah. This, is what, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? I have, I have not been 60 miles per hour in a car in four years. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs>
essay or speech. I can't remember what it was. No, the lecture is given, actually. Basically. So it's a lecture. Yes. Thank you, Father. On what the 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 um, uh, Adam and Eve clothing themselves in figs or in, 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 in leaves yeah. and like how that translates to the ego. It's like it was like every page it was like you know when there's like um like a symphony i guess and you're just like overwhelmed by the movements and the and the inter interwovenness of how and how everything is just working together in this like amazing synergistic energy that book i was just like i was just like felt like my hair should have been flying you know, around. forgive me for digressing because i know we have a ton to talk about but this is relevant right like um today or this this morning um in liturgy um not to be one to kind of recapitulate a, a homily but it's i think relevant here um it was the wedding at cana was mm. the gospel reading and i was sharing today that um there's this thing where we recognize that Christ has saved the best wine for last. Mm. And that best wine that's for last is these incredible conduits of God's grace, these last, these last fathers, that these fathers of the church, these elders, like Elder Milianos, um, St. Ignati Brinocina, of who we, who we commemorated today, you know, like these elders, they bring the human, they bring humanity, they bring the body of Christ to depths of spirituality and communion with God that the prophets longed to have. The best wine is last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they think, and and my whole thing is like, we're not done yet. Yeah. Like, who knows? Who knows who else God is going to reveal? It's like, you know, there's this saying, and it's uh, I want to say. I think it was Emilianos who said it, but it might have been St. Nikolai um, of Zicha, but they were talking about St. Siloam. I think it was it was St. Nikolai of Zicha. And St. Siloam, you know, someone was saying, like, oh, you know, Siloam's, you know, like basically comparing him to uh, Simeon, St. Simeon, uh, the new theologian. And if you've ever read any St. Simeon theologian, they'll just will destroy you. He'll destroy you. But he says, no, he's better than, than Simeon because his word is healing. Like what Saint, what Siloam, what God brought through Siloam is healing. And he's like, he's greater. And you see this and it's like St. Siloam is, you know, everyone says he's one of the greatest saints of the 20th century. Sure. But like, he's just one of the greatest saints. And then you can keep moving forward. You know, there's Emilianos who's not, canonized yet but you read a stuff for like this is this is a, this is another world yeah and you have all these other holy elders it's like porfirios and saint joseph the hesychast and then there's other ones i mean even elder Ephraim. i mean it's like what saint has planted like 20 monasteries you know what i mean sure. there's the last wine kept back the, is the best wine so anyways it, there's just so much we also so, just gotta throw our boy saint paisios in there as well I oh, mean, of course i, I mean we I could mean, just that guy, I mean, yeah, who, we could, yeah. And then I want to shout out Athenite Flowers. Um, I, I was given to that book by um, a brother in the church, and that's also one hundred percent very, very practical. Just like very laid out, very much like um, da 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 da. So if this is this, then this is this, and it's like okay, all right, yeah. And it's it's a little bit. Um, it's like um it's like a balm a little bit you know it's like if you you need to cool down off of something a little bit heavier you can kind of turn to that a little bit with with still a little bit of that like that like ooh it's gonna prick you a little bit so yeah that's good stuff uh and that's pretty much it okay so gentlemen it's your show I I don't know what you want to talk about specifically but I imagine that there's some topics and they need to be discussed. And I'm not the one to get it started. Well, I mean, do you have something in, in mind for the immediate father? Well, I mean, there's a couple of events that have happened subsequently since our last conversation. One of them being 
um, this scandal that happened uh, on the continent of Africa with the quote unquote ordination of the quote unquote uh, female deacon. That's one. That's a that's a really big one. Um, and then, of course, you know, in the same neighborhood, there's um, Metropolitan uh, Altipeforos and his um, very bold affirmation of uh, homosexuality. Um, I mean, those two alone, you know, we could we could spend a lot on. <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on, you know. Um, so I think I mean they're both they're kind of related to each other in a way. They're absolutely. I mean, the question would be: is how are they not related? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're how could how are they not related? Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think just kind of jumping in because um, I've been a little active, kind of throwing out my my perspective on it. But I think for the for the broader kind of audience, um, you know, I, I saw really early on the problem um, with basically the trap that how, that how it was laid out and mm-hmm. the trap being first and foremost, that it was that this sham, this travesty was perpetrated uh, in Africa, on, on Africa. Yeah. You in know, Africa. in Africa, the continent of Africa, and it being perpetrated, you know, it's for as a hostage situation. Sure. Um, could you could you expand on that just a little bit, please? Sure. So, for, for most people watching, probably know, but for the few who don't, just to give a little bit of kind of geopolitical context, there's been. Uh, really strong tensions uh, in Africa, the continent of Africa, between the Alexandrian Church, which is essentially the Greek, mm-hmm. uh, well, essentially the the um, the ecumenical patriarchate, an extension of the ecumenical patriarchate, right, mm-hmm. uh, Bartholomew, and so um, and that and the Russian Church, and so you know, a few years ago kind of came to a head where there was, I think like a hundred something, a hundred like plus um, clergymen who had, who had petitioned um, the MP on the Moscow Patriarchate to be taken under the Mephorian of Russia, basically because of the um, scandalous and um, basically the, the kind of um, Judas, like position that the patriarchate of Alexandria had taken in regards to um, siding with the um, Orthodox Church in Ukraine as opposed to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, meaning that they sided with the schismatic, Zelensky. yeah, yeah, Zelensky and the basically the NATO backed um, puppet of, of mm-hmm. the church, sure, and the. The reason why the betrayal was there is because the, Theodoros had previously had said that he supported the canonical church uh, under uh, hmm. Metropolitan Onufrius, and then, like you know, just basically overnight flip flopped, hmm. and so from there, you know, um, it caused this problem, and so these African clergy had petitioned to be brought into the into Russia. <laughs> so the case that I was making then was that. You know, you saw how, um, and it, it it played out just kind of like how you commented in the thread, Andrew. But it played out. It's like these African clergy um, who are representing communities. So it's not just like individual priests, right? They're representing communities. They they speak out. And all these people, all the Facebook warriors, and all the the liberal, you know, the the very the materialist kind of political. Um, you can orthodox. just say Jews, Father. <laughs> the, 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 the orthodox. You yeah, know, no, the, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm the, just kidding. Like, like Holy Thursday Jews. But <laughs> um, they, yeah. they were all in an uproar, and they were just kind of making all these comments about, you know, these African priests are just wanting money and, and all this stuff. And, 
it just it show it reveals how they really see because it it's it's no different than here because people who tend to have those tendencies forgive me for being redundant they don't really care about the poor they don't like the poor they the poor are these abstract numbers and abstract kind of um, effigies of their own kind of uh, projections of what they don't like they don't care about the poor so in the same sense these people don't care about the poor or they don't care about the africans if they disagree with them so very quickly all these people are like oh africa orthodox africa you know they're like oh uh maybe not because they are wanting to actually go with the russians and they're disagreeing with siding with you know these nato backed western powers and all this you know hooey so anyway so that that caused a problem and I, and I just want to dive in on this because once you have this context then when I jump into what happened recently it, it makes way more sense so what I was saying then was that you, you see the racism and this is a whole nother this is a whole nother topic because um what I maintain is that you know that kind of low expectation that's the true racism you know the kind of yeah. like oh you poor you know <laughs> You poor things, you have no idea what you're doing. You know, we'll come in and save you and tell you the, the right thing. But what people could not imagine is that these African priests actually have a liturgical, ecclesiological conscience. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, sure. they, they can't imagine that. They just think that they're just, you know, glad to get, you know, some vestments and, and whatever. Um, and so because of that, you know, they're, they're just kind of poo-pooing and villainizing Russia. But Again, there was empirical evidence to point to, I think, and I still maintain. um, And of course, there's always human beings and, you know, nuance and sin, but um, that the good intentions of Russia, because Russia did not accept them right away. In fact, Russia, if I'm not mistaken, waited two years before they even allowed even like to, to really entertain taking in these Africans. So after two years of waiting and trying not to cause any problems, they finally said, well, fine, if you're not going to do anything about it, then, then we'll take them in. So subsequently from there, it, ca- it began to cause quote unquote division. And there was this whole thing about all well, now all of a sudden people were like, Oh, look at what the Russian church is doing, blah, blah, blah. And this was coinciding very nicely and neatly with people's perceptions of quote unquote Russia and invading Ukraine. But of course, As you know, no one ever talked about what was happening in the Donbass for years. No one ever talked about, like, (laughs) you know, 2014. Well, some of them did talk about the Nazis when it was convenient. But now that Russia was invading, the Nazis disappeared. We're all aware of that, right? But that's reality. And so that situation, that context shows you, you know, what I consider the hostage situation. Because... I do maintain this. I, I do find that Africans and just black people in general are often used. Um, that to me is where the systematic racism is. It's not so much in what people point to as the kind of right wing and lib- libertarians and all that. It's actually um, th- tends to be the left who are actually consistently using black people and Africans as hostages. What I mean by that is they use, you know, a hostage situation, you grab the person. And you're like, if you check, if you come after me, I'm, they're going to get it. They're going to get it, you know? And so they'll grab these communities and just use them as body shields to cover their nefarious deeds. So the church of Alexandria didn't, I mean, I could just spend all night talking to you about personal experience and talking with African clergy, including the hierarch, complaining about how the Greeks treated them until this happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's no longer it's no longer the case. But the reality is, is <clears throat> anyone who's aware of the situation would know that, you know, the notoriously um, the African church is notoriously those who have been under the Greeks are notoriously, you know, kind of treated like the redheaded stepchildren. And so and- the Russians come in and finally give, you know, some, you know, some 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 <laughs> some liturgical strength and credit and dignity and all these things people lose their mind so again all of the kind of misdeeds and neglect are obfuscated by cries of racism are you following me so you forward now and this this atrocity is taking place where this quote-unquote uh deaconess is quote-unquote ordained of course it's in africa because the powers that be that are looking to undermine the church and fashion the church 
antichrist in the shape of, you know, not of God, in the image not of God, um, they could not get away with it in the same way anywhere else. But if you do it on Afri in, in, in Africa, then you can just, anytime someone's going to, you know, basically call it to task and, and call out the, the real problems there, racism, nope, racism, that's, they're being racist. And so it's a hostage situation. So if I could bring it down, mm -hmm. just in case, yeah, it's a little bit like, um some of the bigger movie production companies have been doing recently where they maybe gender or race swap a character like a, maybe a main character or whatever mm -hmm. and then make a so-so movie and if the movie gets any kind of well this is just not a very well done movie it's instantly racist. You are a racist. You're mm -hmm. a racist. You don't like women. You don't like powerful women. You don't like black mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's happens to be a gay character in it, whatever. Mm -hmm. That was just not a very good movie. Mm -hmm. It's just not very well right. done. It's like, no, 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 no. You're racist. You're right. misogynist, whatever. Just or, or, and again, it applies even in, in any of the identitarian politics. Like there's that one, I can't remember. Oh, the girl who played She-Hulk. And she started flipping out um, on all the fans saying like, oh, see, all these fans, they're all misogynists. They all hate women because, you know, they basically couldn't stand her performance as She-Hulk. And they thought She-Hulk was just, you know, and I don't want to get into the whole thing about She-Hulk. I'm just saying it, it that tactic applies. Mm -hmm. right? that, that, so she applied it there. She's like, oh, it couldn't be that it wasn't that great. It had to be because she was a woman. You know yeah. What I mean? yeah, that that's kind of the. The, the whole strategy is like it's kind of couch this whole movie in identity politics so that mm -hmm. if the quality of the movie is dared called into question right. it's like and just one last example and then we can move on but there's that buddies movie or whatever that was like the first openly like gay male rom-com rom or whatever yeah i never saw it well, <laughs> well shocker i didn't either <laughs> but um it's uh but it didn't do well. It flopped mm -hmm. horribly. And the like it sold out really well in New York and Los Angeles. But mm -hmm. everywhere between, from what I understand, didn't really sell that well. And then the director came out and was like, well, it's just because everyone's homophobic. Mm -hmm. It couldn't possibly be that it's just not a very good movie or that, mm -hmm. you know, that is right. kind of weird to watch a rom-com right. with two dudes, you know, with like right. whatever that entails. Yeah. So. so. So there's that. I mean, that's just on the face of it, right? But that... That's the setup. That's the play. But moving past that, obviously, there's all these things which are really um, – they're delicate. It's like this is the part where I think, you know, we have to kind of come in and, and really get into something because that's kind of low-hanging fruit. But this is a situation where I look at it, it's like in the movies where it's like, or like a Batman episode where the Joker sets a bomb and it's like, which wire? You know what I mean? And like, there's the swag is like, well, which wire is it? And yeah. everything's intentionally like color coded the same way or whatever, just to kind of really, because now the trap is, and I've seen it. I, I saw, you know, through the various, because I became fascinated. I saw it through, the, through some various channels, some various platforms, having kind of commented on a couple of them where it was like, for instance, yeah, see, you know, anyone who even talks about deaconesses, stay away from them because it's an obvious sign that they are aligned with whatever. And I was like, ah, 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 ah. hold on. Mm -hmm. hold on. Cause that's not true either because that's part of the trap here. Right. If you think it's just about trying to ramrod you know, kind of women's rights down the throat of everybody, you're, you are naive. You're missing almost half of the, half of the play. Because what happens is if you take that position of just like, okay, yep. Carte Blanche, any talk about deaconesses is just completely nuts. And you're just, you know, a kind of, you know, you're there to subvert. Then you run to all, you run to some serious problems in regards of you now become a means of undermining church hagiography, mm -hmm. right? Um, church, you know, tradition, mm -hmm. you know?
you begin to really, and you begin to, it's, you get into an issue of pneumatology of like, what is the Holy Spirit allowed to do? Right. So you see the trap here is very delicate because on the one hand, if you bring up nuance and someone, this, the same thinking, the same thought process, although I'm, I'm obviously, you know, um, sympathetic to it, but the thought process is, you know, if you're bringing up nuance, you're just trying to wear me down and to, and to just kind of like, you know, play word games and no, 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 that's dangerous too. Because again, just to make it kind of simple, we can dig in whatever, but there's historical precedent for the deaconess, mm-hmm. right? So if you begin to, but, it, but father, forgive me. It isn't the, it, but it isn't the office of the deacon no, that no. these people, that the these point. women were, you're right. Exactly. And that's exactly. the point. And that's the point is that if you don't start making those distinctions, you become an unknow- an unwittingly used tool to begin to kind of like saw off and bludgeon, you know, yourself from, you know, the tradition, if it was possible. But the other thing is you begin to kind of prove the point. It's almost like um, it's, it's in this case, you think it's a game of you you think you're, you're in a Muay Thai match and it's really judo. And the more you want to come in hard on it, they're like, great, because they're going to use your force to make things really difficult. <laughs> so it just proves the point. The more you come, the more you come in hard, and are very, you know, obtuse and hard-headed about these things, then it just, it, it gives that initial evidence of like, see, I told you. You know, it's kind of like cops or people in authority who are corrupt, not all cops or whatever, people, the, you know, if <laughs> one of the first things my dad taught me about being in the street was don't let them get you mad. Because mm. my dad told me, he's like, if you run again, if you run across a cop that's got a problem, he's going to try to get you mad on purpose. Because that's he's trying to goad you into something or anybody else. I mean, just not to be a cop, but I'm just saying in a position of authority, it makes more sense in people's minds. But that position of being goaded to kind of just get angry and not think. This is very much what this is. And so, yeah, you know, this issue of hagiography, you know, the 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 tradition of 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 saints, the saints who, who have been deaconesses, but also too, what it is, pneumatology, what the Holy Spirit's allowed to do. And there's just these things you have to think about. It's like the nuance of, in the, if this makes sense to people, a deaconess is not a deacon, right? The role of deaconess is really some is about the role and the function of you know a conserv a, a traditional society where the the complementary nature of sexes is respected, right? So. Um, Boyan had put a a, a tech or a, oh yeah, you know, it was really good actually. Yeah. It's like it's it's true. It's like these people who are losing their minds about the the quote unquote deaconess. It's like do you these people do not want to go back to a world where the deaconess is necessary because the role of the deaconess is to tend to to help hierarchs and clergy tend to the needs of of women in a society where. The, the roles of women and the sanctity of women, I would argue is, is, is honored way more than it is now. So that, that's, that's a really, you know, kind of powerful thing if you begin to think about it, but there's so many other things. I mean, this woman, like, Bob, let me just kind of, you know, just for the sake of forwarding the conversation, I'm, I'm for the role of the deaconess. I'm, I'm all for it. And I think that, there's there's actually a place for the deaconess in 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 the church now, but it's not what people think it is. And and the stipulations are 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 everything. Number one, it's not a deacon. The deaconess it can never be seen as an order of the priesthood. That's the that's a huge that's one of the biggest problems because you know as we sing in the Paschal Canons, um, Christ. Christ revealed himself as the male sex. You know, the priesthood, it says that in the Paschal Canons, or if you're praying the Paschal Canons, you pray this, it's like that the priesthood has to be male. That that and we can get in on a whole nother thing on that. But that that's the first thing. It cannot and is not an order of the priesthood, deaconess. The other thing is deaconess has to be essentially monastic. Has to be monastic. Mm. And what was so interesting here is this woman was 
not only not wearing a head covering, yeah, yeah. like yeah. not wearing a head covering, but this woman is married and she was probably menstruating when she was ordained too, just to kind of put salt <laughs> in the wound. Sure. You know what I mean? So, and that's the whole thing we can talk about too, you know? Um, so like all of these things are, are kind of wrapped in this like spicy burrito or this atom bomb, however you want to look at it To And the fact that it was done on Holy, I think it's Holy Thursday. That's not an, that's not a coincidence. For real either you know so this is a huge thing and the only way to reconcile it is to depose that bishop and burn that church down <laughs> so hey that's very hey believe it or not that is pretty royal path actually like that is like that is the royal path but father it was interesting father peter here's actually had a video about why they're not women clergy mm-hmm. he's basically because there never have been like they, we just don't, that's it. He's like, I could go into all the reasons why it has to be a male that has to be the priest, but it's just in the end of the day, the only thing I have to answer is because there never has been, there doesn't need to be. It's, yeah. it's, that is the church. We've never done it and we don't need to do it. Right. It was good. It was a good video. Well, there's, a, I, I think there's a corollary to that as well. And it's something like, a demand on whoever wants to ordain female deacons that they're going to have to explain why now there needs to be female Mm -hmm. deacons and they're going to have to explain it in the context of like there's no other reason except for the holy spirit is demanding it of the church at this moment and if they can't present that then it doesn't happen yeah it seems very simple to me and i have not heard that presented because the holy spirit isn't and that (laughs) exactly (laughs) you know and and a, a great example, you know, I'm just I spoke with uh, an African, uh, an African clergyman. So African, not, you know, black American, African-American, African, who's let's just say not in the Russian church. And he was like, I asked him, I was like, well, what is what's up with this? And he's like, yeah, it's many clergy are confused and, and, and upset about it. So this isn't just a but I mean, and. I'm sure he wasn't talking about people who have already sought refuge under the Russian, uh, under the MP, the Russian Amalfurian. I mean, he's probably talking about, you know, clergy there. So, um, you know, and again, everybody kind of spins it one way or another, but, um, you know, the, it's tough. I want to, I want to be careful here because I, I just know, it's delicate and and I mean who am I to say? But um I think that because of the context in which this happened, not just what I spoke of earlier in regards to this kind of geopolitical contact uh context with um the Church of Alexandria and everything else, but also what's going on with the LDB Foros and these these really major changes that are being pushed by these um, kind of NATO shill churches. It's like it's it's heavy, you know. It's 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 really heavy. The the thing that stood out to me with the LPD Foros quote and how it was, I, I looked at it and I was like, "Ooh, this is really like serpentine." Is yeah. he said, uh, you know, it's it's unchristian or it's not right, whatever. To he said, separate people based on their love life. But he was talking about homosexuality. Mm-hmm. But as uh, being orthodox, you can't equate homosexuality with love. No. And that's the problem. You, it can't be a love life. So I well, don't even know what he's talking about. Well, here, here's part of the problem, too, is that, um, like, do you even do theology, bro? Like, what what does that even mean, you know? And And full disclosure... You know, I get kind of verbose and all that stuff. But part of my big thing, the reason why I believe I exist is I I try at least. I think there's some evidence that just on me on a personal level, my big thing is trying to actually take the theology of the church and make it approachable and applicable to the everyday guy or whatever. You know what I mean? So the reason why I'm saying that is because it's still about in the realm of theology. So what is being revealed about God? What he's talking about is just, it, I mean, it, it, it's just 
cycle like it's his contemporary it's like world. the clean your room thing with jordan it, i mean it's, it's even worse than that it's just yeah i think it's it, it's it's more nonsensical than I mean, that like peterson's got some that. yeah i mean this is just what are you time stamp like, that by the way what are you talking about you know oh we gotta talk about that too so <laughs> so i i think that's the thing is when you when you read it you're like this is potentially the the next ecumenical patriarch patriarch like what are you talking about there's love what do you mean love like this is this is absurd this is i mean this is the ethics of you know a 14 year old boy what do you <laughs> what do you what do you mean like what are you talking about so well e- even if it was father forgive me even if it was heterosexual yet outside of marriage so therefore fornication yeah. It still is not, you can't say, and as somebody who is in vast and probably eternal repentance for that, like for my, that in my own life, is that you can't say that you love that person. Like, I, no. I can't say that I love that woman if I'm fornicating with her. No, but that's I what can't I can't mean say by, that. But that's what I mean by the ethics of a 14 year old boy. Like, he's giving the justifications that a 14 year old, 15 year old boy would give to his parents who are like, Jimmy. What are you doing? Like we raised you differently. Oh come on, mom. You know, blah blah blah. That's like that's essentially his ethics and his his philosophical approach to it. It's 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 shocking. You know, it's shocking. So this is and again when you uh, when you realize that this is the exposure that the world has of orthodoxy. See, the world doesn't have. Exp- I mean. The world doesn't have exposure of orthodoxy of the things that we're chewing on. And even it like, okay, who has, who's like a big heavy hitter number wise? Father Spiridon? Okay. You know? And then what? Father Peter? Okay. You know? And then, you know, there's a couple others that, but like, that's still a drop in the bucket. Most people are getting this exposure. And I know the arguments, because like, people are like, well, Yes, but the vast majority of blah, blah, blah. But but the reality is, is the way the world is, this is moving with the current of the world. So it's a lot easier to disseminate it in that way. And this is what the world is seeing of orthodoxy, way more than whatever we're hoping they're seeing. So to me, that's also problematic, you know? Because well, my, the, Father, for, for, yeah. for, forgive me, Father. How do we? The question that I want answered, like that, that is important to me, and I think it's probably important to a lot of people, is like, how do we deal with the fact that people who encounter us who are not let's let's say they're Ro- they're Latin, they're Roman Catholic, or whatever, and they encounter us and they say, well, but no, but the Orthodox Church believes this because look, here's your hierarch who's saying this. Mm-hmm. So obviously, the Church must believe this because what why. That, the, otherwise, a hierarch wouldn't say it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of like, um, like a penance, maybe for us, like, critis- like making fun of the Pope so much. I'm not. I mean, like, I'm not well, saying it, actually. Well, I'm just I mean, talking there's, here. I mean, there's there's something to it in the sense of, like, um, what's his name, Taylor Marshall. You know, obviously jumped on real quick about that, and he's like, "Oh, Orthodox Bros or you know, complaining about us and it's like, look what you just did, you know. But what that does, is it just goes to show I, that was so, that was kind of interesting coming from him because I, I've learned my lesson. Just don't you know, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. But the fact that he did that, it was kind of like he really doesn't understand orthodoxy then, because for most people, that is a problem with Andrew with um. Uh, Cyprian saying most people they wouldn't be able to discern that they would just think like yeah here's your obvious most here's the obviously uh most visible hierarchy so he must be your equivalent of the pope that's how most people would would look at it and that's how you know the ep pushes it right intentionally and you know uh vatican supports that narrative but when you start getting into people, you know, these, these, you know, um, not high level, but um, well publicized um, pundits like Taylor Marshall and some of these other people, it's like, 
you know, their whole shtick is, you know, they're educated and they understand these things and their own apologetics in their own context. But it just goes to show they really don't understand the nature of the church because anyone who's just spent a little bit of time would understand that. Um, and, and if anything, that's the greater argument against us is that, you know, if you didn't know any better, we, we just look like we're, you know, fracture upon fracture, schism upon schism. Right. But if you understand the nature of, of, of what the church is and, and the history of the church, then these things don't phase you. Um, Athanasius against the world. Right. It's not it doesn't mean anything to have the majority of the institutional church fall into error and heresy, because that that's happened in, in history several, several times. Um, and it just goes to show you the nature of the disingenuous, uh, the disingenuous nature of a lot of these critiques but it is a problem because as orthodoxy is growing and it's getting exposure there are people who um, get confused and there is no small portion of you know people on that side of the fence and not necessarily you know GOA but people who see it that way there's there's unfortunately there's more than we'd like to admit of Orthodox who just think, yeah, this is just the way it should be. I mean, I've dealt, I've personally dealt with them who um, they feel, you know, oh, well, your vision of what the church is, is backwards. You know, it's like, okay. Yes. What's the GOA that you mentioned? Sorry. Is that um, the Greek Orthodox gotcha. Archdiocese. Okay. Right? okay. Just wanted to make sure, because I was like, wait, GOA. I was like, I think it's Greek Orthodox, but I was like, I'm not sure. But Which is the largest jurisdiction, right? Like, by far. Like, you put all the jurisdictions in the states together, They, I think they don't even equal up to what the GOA is in, is by numbers. That may have changed. Some will click the clack and kind of say, actually, it changed in this, but um, it's been such a long time. But for the longest time, and unless something's changed, that's how the statistics play out. Sure. So on a scale of one to 10, how involved are the bricklayers in this whole thing? I mean, I'm just like, just, you know, just putting it out there. Cause I mean, then there's the, the, the old calendar, new calendar stuff that was going on. And like uh, yet another show you haven't seen bother, but there's this part in arrested development where he goes up and he asks somebody a question and, the way that it makes it set up is that's going to be this whole long investigation. He has to find something out. And he walks up and he says, Hey, did you do this thing? The guy was like, Oh, most definitely. Like just gives the answer like right away. Mm -hmm. He's like, gotcha. Okay. And turns around and walks away. But you make you think he's going to like have to grill him and kind of like interrogate him a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, is there possibly a chance of some infiltration that might've happened on some level? Like, oh, most definitely. Here's his name. This is when it happened. And it's like, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, you know, because uh, I was talking with um, a Catholic guy about Vatican II. I was like, well, do you think I mean, that's, that was... that's well documented? What happened? I mean, what happened there? Um, I mean, I'm going to have to take your word for that because I don't know. Yeah. I mean, get into like, well, okay, Martin, all that stuff. And, no, but... no, 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 no. It's just <laughs> that there's, there's a, what I'm trying, we don't have to get specific. Yeah. But again, there's a layer of just insidious that, um transcends just ineptitude or like a willing to want to just like make everybody happy there's a sinister element behind it it's not just like oh well we've decided it's 2024 love is love it's like no 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 there's yeah i mean i i think though i think to your point we're we're <laughs> we're headed for that i mean it, it's almost um i don't know this is this is I don't even know if this is a conversation, but I think it's imminent, you know, um, how and when, I don't know, but I, I think that the reality is, is next year, you know, there's all this talk about things just kind of really coming to a head next year in regards of, you know, the calendars are going to match up. The Paschal calendars are going to match up. There's going to be the big push, the kind of commemoration of Nicaea. Um, there's lots of talk. Um, during Pascha about that. Um, there was some pretty, you know, bold things that were said about um, this really is 
you know, it was going to be the last time that Christians aren't celebrating on the same calendar and all that language. If you don't know better, it just sounds like, yeah, that's good. And that again, sets up this whole thing of, man, why are these Orthodox pointing to people like us? You guys just don't want to get along. You guys just feed off of being anti and contrarian and all this stuff. And it's quite the opposite actually. Um, but the reality is, is that that narrative is a convincing one, unfortunately. Um, and and I, I think we don't help it sometimes. You know, I think that um, kind of getting back to this disposition that I was talking about with the deaconess issue is that people just, you know, they, they, they know, I, I don't know what's right. I just know that that's wrong. And so they kind of just get blinders on and they they become bulls in the china shop and that's that's just problematic because you know we do not do our lord any justice when we are i'm just anti just because you know um i just don't for instance there just shouldn't be female priests just because women are dumb and they can't be priests that doesn't help anybody Sure. And, and that's and that's not the position of the church, but when someone, when you don't actually have an answer that's come to you through prayer, um, and you still feel it's incumbent upon you to comment on it, that's what happens. You know what I mean? I'll give you an example why I said prayer. It's like the old the, the calendar issues, and you know Saint Joseph the Hesychast. Well, he was on the he was in the camp of the zealots of the old calendars. And, you know, it came down to the point, long story short, where it was like, everyone was like, you're on though, what are you going to do? Because, you know, clearly you're on this, you know, clearly you, you understand the truth is that the calendar issue is wrong and blah, blah, blah. And I know there's people going to write and say it doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. But just hear the story for, for the point of our, what I'm trying to get across. And Elder Joseph, instead of just kind of sitting down and thinking about it, which is what most people do. He actually prayed about it, and God revealed to him that the old calendars were correct. The old calendars were correct, that the change of the of the calendar is wrong, but the ethos in which they were doing it was wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's why he he no longer sci you know joined up with the quote unquote zealots. Now, someone takes that. And they go like, yeah, see, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, it's not, yeah, see, because, you know, we already had conversations about the old calendar. It, but that goes to show you the, the need for nuance and delicacy, not in a slick willy type of way, but in the way of Batman diffusing the bomb that the Joker has set up. And you just kind of want to, like, I'm just going to rip all the wires out. It's like, okay, well, you just blew everybody to hell. Thanks. That didn't do anything. You know, that that's what I'm trying to get across with approaching these things, um, because that's part of the trap. If you think that it's just about trying to ramrod, like I said, I repeat myself. So I can. Sorry. Yeah, I just realized. Remember at the end of Civil War that. Sorry, I'm, I'm that guy. This is what I do. Um, <laughs> but Cap is clearly getting ready to beat iron man yeah. like he's clearly and then the emts grab him and cap's like back up i don't want to hurt you and the emt is like what do you mean you've been hurting us this whole time and he turns around and they see the swath of destruction that they've caused and cap suddenly has this moment of being like they're right we're not fighting for the people anymore look at us we're just fighting mm -hmm. we're just fighting just to fight and then he's like and like but we're winning he's like yeah everything except the argument like we're done. We've missed the point. We've like we've made this about ramrodding. It's no longer mm -hmm. about what's best for people. It's no longer and then you know what we're talking about. It's no longer about what's best for the health of the church or you know, you know, in the sake of mercy and love or compassion or whatever. It's like um it's like no, we're just focused on the argument. So that's it. I'm done. Well, doing the right, doing the right thing for the wrong reason is not doing the right. You're not doing the right thing if you're doing it for the wrong reason, right? Like, oh. there's no, 
there's no order there. It's like it's the it's the broken clock that's right twice a day. Yeah. There's no the broken clock is still out of order, even though when you look at it twice a day, like it's in the right place, you know. And so I think that this this is what's so missing from all of this is it seems like the why is just missing over and over. The state the statement from El Pitaforos, the the um Deaconesses being the deaconess, not even deaconess, female deacon being ordained. Like there's no, there's no why. It's all like what, what, what. And I think to your point, Father, like the big temptation of the world right now, if you look around, is it's like everybody's ideology is an anti ideology. Mm -hmm. Nobody's for anything. Nobody's right. oriented toward anything. No one's going to prayer toward anything everybody's anti everything yeah. and they make their purity test against anti that's right man right like it's not enough to be not racist you have to be anti-racist anti -racist, yep. yeah everything is anti 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 and it's like it's only the church this is one of the things that brought me to the church was i looked around and i was like oh this is the only thing that's out there that's pointed at something yeah that isn't completely focused on what it's not it's the only thing everybody else is who who i'm against and what i'm against and that defines me yep. and yeah. it's 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 really problematic because getting to like again the heart of the issue is well how can we discern these things well do we do we really desire christ you know are we are we really desiring christ and Again, I just bring that up because that's how, that's how St. Joseph did it. St. Joseph discerned it by just wanting Christ, caring about Christ, doing what, you know what I mean? And really seeking the wisdom of Christ. And the reality of, you know, that can not be a satisfying, quick, easy, you know, get, just give me the, the kind of textbook answer. You know, and, and that brings us back to why if there's no praxis, then, you know, if, if you're asking for discernment, but you have no praxis, it's like asking for wine and you have no cup. You know what I mean? You need to really get a cup first and then, uh, then maybe you can get some wine. But, you know, I... I, I think it's difficult because these things, again, this is just like so much what we talked about where, you know, it, of course it's, it's infuriating and it, it's really frustrating and discouraging and all that, but we have to have, um, we have to have the patience of the saints in the sense of just really um, not sitting back and not caring and being indifferent far from it, but we have to be very, wise you know again wise as serpents harmless and doves and, and and really wanting you know the church to be the church to be the church um because of love love of christ and not the church to be you know not treating the church like it's our own kind of like personal living room where we want to keep it nice and clean according to what we want you know um yeah there's with with there's been a few different people who I have heard talking about, you know, feeling like whatever it was that 2020 was the warm up for is like, as you said, like 2025 coming to a head. There's a, quite a few people who like are quite sensitive that and I've been getting this same thought, but like what's. What's been coming up in my conversations with people is that like and it's it's to this point of prayer and to this point of like the um, pre preservation of the church for the purpose of, you know, allowing us to constantly be cleaning the cup, to construct the cup, mm -hmm. or to let the cup be, be constructed for us, and then to be constantly cleaning it. And one, but one of the things that I'm seeing a, a temptation, even from people who, who are, some of them newly orthodox, is immediately this desire to in terms of the the arc building like that the desire is not necessarily for that internal cup but the desire is for like almost a demand sometimes it's a demand of me sometimes it's a demand of others like what should i do like what should i do in like a worldly sense like a prepping type of sense mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. as opposed to and and being very sort of dismayed 
when I say, well, it's, well, pray. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, and for me, it's very genuine now because like, I'm on an island in the middle of nowhere. Like, and so far what I've had has been prayer and, and Christ. And that's it, right? Yeah. Because there's not much else in terms of resources. But yet, miraculously, and I could say that, like, I can genuinely say that Christ provides and that it's like, it's a real thing at this point to me. There's no way I could chalk it up to coincidence or luck or anything like that. That it's like, no, there's someone at work. And that it seems to me that like, that's, this is this is a very like um this desire to have the church but to have the church in the world which is where i think that a lot of these like the female deaconess the el pitaforos thing like ev all of these things is like yeah i want the church i want orthodoxy yeah. but like let's i i want it so that i can bring it into the world and have it and still be of the world and still be orthodox yeah and that's the and that's this pull that's it's like this immediate pull away it feels it feels to me even when i even think about that in my own life it's like i it's like i almost instantly know that if i do that like it's really going to be curtains because it's because the only thing that that has held me over in the last four years is turning towards christ Mm. Well, I, I think it gets us down to some of the ways that you can discern some of these things. Because like we talked about this before, it's like praxis and really understanding where that's almost like your litmus. You know, if if you kind of roll your eyes at that stuff, this is a common thing where it's like there's these threads where I see when someone takes um, the praxis of the church um, seriously and even something like, you know, some of the um, aspects of, of of purity, you know, ritual ritual purity that is part of the church, and they reject that, and they reject it, they reject it, and they um, take scripture out of context or scriptural accounts, I should say, out of context, and they and they want to create these narratives of those things don't matter because it's keeping people away from God and blah blah blah. You can start seeing where this where those people with those mindsets, not only what, what they're made out of, but where they're headed because their intention is never really about Christ. It's really always about the people, you know, getting back to th this kind of quote unquote people. And, and I, I think it's really problematic because this, you know, again, like Judas, right. What's the spike nard being wasted? It could have been used to feed the poor. I mean, you just didn't care about the poor. And oh, so deep, so deep. You know, Judas didn't care about the poor, you know, but he used that, and so people use that. And this is this is what I find. It's like if you these, you're not going to be able to discern any of these things because if you're if you're not concerned really about Christ, meaning that for you to be able to give everything you have of the precious ointment and and take the thing that is precious to your identity, which is hair. So the woman's hair is precious to her identity, um, or at least it was at that period of time. And then you and then you take that most precious thing as a marker of your being, and you use that in just the most vulnerable act of worship. And that's how you want to live your life, because that's how I would characterize my life. And that's how I, that's, you know, that's how I, try to form my spiritual children is to have that kind of ethos to have that ethos of your most vulnerable aspect of your life. This is what you need to offer, you know, uh, to Christ. There's people who they just find that absolutely absurd. They would never say the way I'm phrasing it is, is absurd. They would just say, Oh, these things that you say, you know, father, fill in the blank, father, turbo, father, you know, whatever, and it's all these things, right? And it's, this is, I just want to say this, right? It's the small things that they think that's just from a bygone era. And it sure, it kind of all centers around women, but guess what, man? The church centers around women. The biggest icon, the church is the mother of God. Women are the ones who, women are the ones who, who run the parish. The women are the lifeblood of the parish. You know, any good priest will tell you, it's like, 
the parish doesn't run if there isn't the women. So if it feels like I'm always honing on women, it's because I know the value of women, right? But see, so does the enemy. And the enemy hates women. And the enemy will use other women to undermine the value of women. You know, I got this one woman who she's, she's just, you know, God bless her. I'm thankful for her. I, I pray for her. She's a blessing to me. But, you know, she's just one of these typical detractors who, the, oh, you're a misogynist, this and that. You know, you have your women head covered. You know, it's like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, you you know, women can't commune during their, during their cycles. It's like all this stuff. And it's like, well, yeah. You know, I mean, if you just look at what the, how the church functions and why, and then you begin to just say, okay, well, this is what the church has done, and give the church the benefit of the doubt, and go, okay, well, there's a reason for this. Let me, let me find out. Let me, let me humble myself and just start there. But they never even get that far. No. They never even get that far where they'll say, like, okay, I don't like this, but at least let me find out. See that that's that right there is the first test. Because I would argue. If you really want to get into the point of discipleship, you got to find that thing that you're like, man, I really wish this wasn't the case, but it's not really, it's not really about what I want. You know, if you really, if you're like, am I really in Christ? Am I really Orthodox? Well, find that thing that you don't like. Find that canon, quote unquote, that you don't like. Find that thing that you feel is impinging on your kind of quote unquote personal freedom or your tastes. And then go for it, Jimmy, and you'll find real quick where you stand. And and I think this may seem like a tangent to people, but it's not because these people are the ones who are applauding. And there's plenty of people who are applauding this, this poor woman being used by this scandalous charlatan of a bishop. You know, I'm sorry. Didn't she even have like apprehensive feelings about yeah. doing it? She yeah. was like, I'm not sure this is She's right. embarrassed. Yeah. And like, so she felt it and like, and then was still pushed forward. Like, shame. Yeah. shame. Well, this, shame. F- Father, this thing, I, I hope we could go like deeper into this idea of finding the thing that where you're like, I don't know, this is, I, I don't know this thing about the church, whether it's female deacons, whether it's, homosexuality, whatever, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. and then finding that thing, finding out the why, really going in, really praying, really having discernment until you get it figured, until, until the Holy Spirit works it out for you. Like, it's so deep. Holy Wednesday really hit me really hard. Mm -hmm. Like, this, this Holy Week, right? Like, Mm -hmm. You know, as before, except this time I did all, you know, all the reader services. I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do my work. Because I remember you had said, you know what? Do the work during Holy Week, right? And it was just like the the harlot and Judas. So this the, the woman and Judas and the interplay there that you just brought up. But like, that was the thing. It really hit me particularly hard. And with everything that you're saying about caring about the poor and everything. And, you know, as I look and I, it, it was the same time that all of these protests were going on. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was like, ah, do these people really care about the Palestinians? No. Like, do they really care about them? No. And I was like, oh, they're Judas. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's like the enemy is going to find that thing in that moment. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if don't be Judas. Mm-hmm. You know, because of, of course he regretted it afterwards. He came back and threw through the money, but it's like he was driven to that point because because there was a lack of trust, a lack of faith, and a lack of willingness to be to look inside himself and be like, "Wait, why do I think that this woman shouldn't be doing this thing here? Why do I think that we should be selling selling this oil and be taking the money, give it to the poor or whatever? Why do I think that?" Why do I even feel like in this moment the master is wrong? Like, why am I feeling this? Well, and if you don't do that, you're going to be driven to that. You're going to be driven to, to to betrayal. I mean, it's interesting, too, because let me, I was speaking with some brothers about this. There's There's two ways we can go on this, and they're not opposed to each other. They're complementary. But 
I'll just go there just for the sake of people's kind of information and then we can go there. But on the one hand, people aren't aware of something. And that is, especially like in the account, the account of Matthew with Judas, it's a, it's a um, scathing incrimination on, on the priesthood. The account of mm. Judas, the scathing incrimination of the priesthood. And the narrative of the gospel with Matthew, who is he writing to? He's writing to Jews. He's, he's seeking to, you know, make the case. And part of, part of what needs to happen there is he needs to show how um, the, you know, the Pharisees and Levitical priesthood have been fundamentally corrupted. And so when Judas comes and he says, I've betrayed innocent blood. He's going to them to like, because what's the priest's job? The priest's job is to tell you how to be reconciled with God. That's the priest's job. So when he goes and he says, I betrayed innocent blood, what am I to do? Uh, what's that to us? See to it, your, you know, see to it yourself. Well, they should have walked him through atonement. You see? Wow. <laughs> okay. So I didn't even realize that until just now. Wow, that's deep. So Matthew's saying, like, look, you know, like this priesthood was already corrupted. And so you that's why in Hebrews and St. Paul talks about a priest that identifies with our with our failures. It, it isn't just our weakness in regards of like quote unquote, you know, I get cancer and I get sick, or you know, I ate too much. It's like, no, like deep, deep fundamental betrayal and weakness because our high priest understands and knows fundamentally what happens when the priesthood fails you. Like this is the narrative. This isn't. This is why he's so upset with them. This is why you can begin to understand when he talks about you should have kept all those small matters without neglecting the weightier ones. Jesus doesn't say no, no, no. You're wrong for tithing cumin and dill. He's like, yeah, you should do that, but the more important things, don't forget it. And that's what they did. So they couldn't even walk him through that. So why is this pertinent? Because on the one hand, I, I. I'm not just trying to be like, oh, look at me. And when I mean it when I say, you know, I wasn't always like this. So it's just the grace of God. But I mean it when I talked about this lady and these, these other people, these enemies I have. I thank God. And I love them because I realize they've just been beguiled, first and foremost, by the serpent, especially women, because women, the, the devil hates you, my daughters. Let me tell you, the devil hates you. All you, my daughters who are listening, the devil hates you. And so the devil primarily wants you to destroy yourself by your own <clears throat> running headlong into the ocean like the pigs who are possessed with demons. Sure. That's what the, that's what they want to do. They want that's how they want to destroy you. They fill you with passions and then they just drive you mad and you're consumed by yourself. That's what feminism is. Feminism is the legion moving into the bigs and just driving women off the cliffs. Like no woman's benefited from feminism and destroys them. So that's you know, that's a whole other thing, right? But at any rate, this is this is why I bring this up because these people have been failed. They've been failed by you know a priestly class who is not concerned with the things of Christ, which is what? Which is how to bring restitution how to bring reconciliation how to bring repentance to people so they could be reconciled with god they're not concerned with it right they want to keep the ex the externals of you know religion for you know it's just i don't know also how to put it and and this is this is what happened so of course you know these people they they they're sincere these people who are like social um activists you know the kind of sjw's on stuff we're trying to bring around they're sincere in it they really think that this is what the church needs but they think that because they're like judas right they've been beguiled by a worldly spirit and there's been no priest to pull them aside and say there's been no priest to say what are you doing you're betraying innocent blood no 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 this is how you this is how you reconcile with god you 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 must have repentance but instead they go like oh yeah okay whatever great give me the money Go on. You know what I mean? So so that's one way to understand it. But another way to understand it is that, you know, 
what's some of the big differences between Judas and, and Peter? Well, you know, Judas fell into despair, right? But Peter fell into denial. See, Peter didn't betray Christ in the way that Judas betrayed Christ. Peter's denial was was fundamentally based upon his own kind of, um, what would you call it? His own bravado, if you will. Okay. What do you mean? Bravado is not the word I didn't, thought you were going to come up with. Uh, what did you think I was going to come up with? Uh, hubris. I don't know. It was like yeah, something... hubris and bravado. It works. Okay. Same, okay. Maybe I don't know what bravado is, but yeah, because like... it's like, hey, I, if everyone leaves you, I'm not going to leave you. Yeah. I, I'm right or die. I'm right or die. You know, and I never, I never forget. You said that in a catechism one time. Some lady was like, "I would get baptized next week." And you're like, good, stick with it. She's like, of course I'm going to stick with it. I'll never leave. And you're like, we'll see. We'll see. And I was just like, that's the, probably the best answer you could have given. I mean, that's, that's very good. But it's, um, so Peter's blustering himself up, you know, and that's what my yeah. baptizing priest always said. But he was always like, Peter was kind of an ass. Like before, before yeah. he was St. Peter, yeah. he was kind of just like, anoint my feet. Oh, I'll never let you anoint my, or, or clean my feet. And Christ is like, let me do it. Yeah. And he's like, okay, then we'll do my whole body. And Christ is like, yeah. okay, just chill out. Like that's what that's what my like baptizing priest had always said. But but like for the person to discern these deeper things, kind of like I I probably way left what Supreme was talking about like 45 minutes ago. But I I think what I'm trying to get at is this is the thing about the scriptures, right? And this is the thing about getting, you know, again. I keep running into this where I'm like, hmm, I really don't know what this person wants. Do they do they want me to give them some kind of orthodoxized, Christianized, you know, kind of like psychoanalysis? Or do they want to live a Christian life? Right? Because if you want to live a Christian life, this is getting into Naaman, right? We know the story of Naaman. We've talked about it before here, right? I mean, okay, yeah. Um. <laughs> I'm like, it's not ringing a bell, but that doesn't mean that we haven't talked about it before. But yeah, he Naaman is the, he's the tax collector in the tree. Is that right? He's no, the guy Zacchaeus. in the tree. That's Zacchaeus. oh, Zacchaeus. Wait, that's who's Naaman? Go into Naaman again. Okay, so so Naaman was this Syrian soldier, this like general who, in the time of mm. Elijah, oh yes, yeah, so to go and Elijah. bathe, to bathe in the Jordan. Yeah, yeah. And Jordan. Elijah yeah, said okay. he had leprosy. And Elijah said, oh, go bathe the Jordan. And Naaman's like, the Jordan? He's like, I came all the way here to bathe in the muddy Jordan. It's like, I'm from Syria. We have amazing rivers and lakes. What am I going to bathe in the mud hole of the Jordan? And his servant's like, master, you know, it basically, if, if he told you to conquer a thousand armies, you would have. Like, you can't, you can't do the simple thing. So this is what happens to a lot of people, a lot of people in a lot of different circumstances. But the real basic things, getting back to praxis and I don't feel like I'm being redundant. I feel like I'm just trying to show everyone how these principles are being laid out. Cause it's not, it's not father Turbo's principles. I'm just showing you what it means to be in the church and to actually what it means to be converted. Right. Like these principles, they play out and they apply to your life. It isn't just when you want to kind of feel orthodox. It's like, you got problems with your wife. You got problems with your boss, you got problems with your sister. You got a problem with your neighbor. You got problems with yourself. All this stuff applies. And the problems that we're facing in regards of charlatan bishops doing, you know, scandalous things to women in Africa, it all applies. It, it all has real life ramifications of what we talk about in regards of the ultimate patterns of reality, which are only experienced in truth in the life of the church. Because when you're in the life of the church, you live in sacramental life, everything you eat, all the love you make all the music you listen to, all of it becomes salvific or damning, right? And and you become aware of that. Mm. <laughs> like, that's what this is, right? So anyways, this thing with Naaman and people, they don't want to do these simple, basic things. And so that's where you get these people who they they just, they reject wholeheartedly the praxis. And, and I guess they reject the tradition of the church 
And so this is why you have like these two churches that already exist. There's already two quote unquote, or not really two churches, only one church, but there's these two quote unquote Orthodox churches, which I've been talking about probably too much uh, that are coexisting now because one is filled with people who think the church should be like the world. And the other one is filled with people who want to be saved. I just feel comfortable saying it that way. That's the, yeah, that that's it right there. That's it right there. I think. You well, said- th- th- I think there's something. There's something. Forget, forgive me, Andrew. I think there's something now. Hearing you say that in this context, it's occurring to me that there's something almost. Oh, I'll, I, I really don't want to say this, but it, but it, I, it seems self-evident to me. There's something almost fundamentally like evil about saying, "Oh no, the homosexuality thing in the church, like it's perfectly fine." Like it's perfectly fine because it's all because you're denying someone the chance at salvation. Mm-hmm. Because if it's perfectly fine, then it's like it's it's like I go to the hospital and I've like got cancer, and they're just like, ah, oh, no, it's not, it's fine. You're good. Get out of here. Yeah, just take. Uh, yeah, just 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 you're fine. You know what I mean? They just send me off with a clean bill of health. There's like there's some there's that's malpractice as a doctor. That would be malpractice yep. for them to do. Yep. Well, Saint John Chrysostom said, "The road to hell." The line with the skulls of priests and the head and the lamppost on the way are the skulls of the bishops. bishops. You know, and so. I and I think and I, I would just say this too, because if we have, I mean, if you don't know now, you know. Um, Ephesians six twelve, like, don't don't get it twisted. You know, I, I'm all about holding people accountable. I mean, not like I mean, who am I? I got no authority, whatever. But. I'm all about holding people accountable, but I also don't want anyone to think that, like, don't think the devil is, is, this is all the devil. I mean, the demons are, (laughs) they are full-fledged motivating so much of this chaos and so much of this um, deception. That's a good word, I feel, deception, because this is what I was talking about with these uh, women, you know, these these women are like, oh, Father Turbo's blah, 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 you know. But they're deceived. Like, these people literally think that they're they're correct. And then someone would say to me, well, how do you know you're correct? And I would say to them, because I was on the edge of shadow and flame. <laughs> and Christ saved me. That's how I know. That's how I know. So, you know, if you're if you're spending if you're spending a lot of your time being angry about the church not keeping up with the world, you got a problem. And I I know plenty of people like that. I don't talk to them anymore. I love them, and I hope that God opens their eyes. Um, and and the great thing about it is if when people are like that then there's such a huge potential for them because let's like solve, let's like solve Tarsus. There's such a huge potential for these people because when they wake up, they're like, Oh my goodness. I've totally been a Judas. I've totally right been a Saul. Tar- yeah. Right yeah. Here. Right here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to ruin Andrew for everybody, but and Andrew's, you know, I've, I've, I've given out lots of work. I can't remember what year you got it, but you got the, you know, most change award one year it's like there's real repentance and so when someone repents he who loves you know he who who do you think has loved much well i suppose the one who's been forgiven much Mm -hmm. bingo bingo and that's why for me getting back to what i was talking about with sweating you know and the whole joker thing it's like that's another portion that all my brothers all my young brothers all you my my young neck bearded young brothers, just want to encourage you: be careful, don't become the thing yeah. that you might end up hating. Because this is the way. The way is to love our enemies, but loving our enemies doesn't doesn't mean co-signing their their atrocities. No, no, no. We love them in the sense of we we ask God to bring them to the fullness of repentance. Because the ones who repent are ones who become great in the kingdom of heaven because they learned to preach righteousness. They learned to live for righteousness. They learned to love God. And, and, and this is, 
really the ultimate trap that the enemy is trying to, you know, that's the real, that's the last wire in the bomb where it's like, huh, huh. it's like, that's the last one. If you can get past that wire and, and learn to not hate these people, then you have a chance of becoming a saint. That's why it's always much easier to look at sin as sickness as opposed to like some moral failing. It's like, oh, it's a sickness. And, you know, that's what one of the sisters from our church, who I'm a big fan of, I just, we're not, we're not typically like close, but like if there's like, we're not, we don't have like, we're not like close personally, but like if there's like a, recap of her life when she's saying stuff i'm usually in the background like eating something like laughing really hard at what she's saying and one of the things that she said was she said i'm a woman i don't need to vote like, i have no business voting and i was just like okay sure that's great but look, just let's just take that statement and let's look at the person or the woman who's absolutely insisting it is their right to vote and then you take those people side by side and who is happier this sister in christ who just said i don't think women need to vote that's the end of the end of the conflict end of the turmoil within her now do i agree with that i don't know i have no idea i i don't really know what is democracy does it really matter i have no idea but like at the end of the day that conflict is done she's happier She's leading a more fulfilling life, which is why, you know, again, this last week or so, I just really struck me as like feminism is a war on women. It's a war to make women miserable. It just does. It just like, I don't know anybody who's just entrenched in these thoughts and these thought patterns and everything who's happy. They're not happy. They're always worked up. They're always angry. And when you learn to kind of suss out when people are just trying to show off, when they're just trying to spout something so that they sound smart or be the interesting person at the party. And more often than not, it tends to be people along that track of thinking. They just tend to, Oh, you know, like, okay, well, we weren't talking about that. You totally ramrodded this conversation into a completely different direction so that you could drop some bit of obscure knowledge. No one is better for after hearing it. Like nobody is better after this. And again, it's not anger. I'm just like, I've been almost exactly where you are. And I was just miserable when I did it. I was putting mm -hmm. all of my thought into things that did not matter and were ultimately fruitless. And when I just kind of was like, well, I, mean, I have no idea. Then it's like, oh, end of conflict. That's it right there. So, um, but they're just not happy. Well, the, the, it, the admission of or the self-awareness of being miserable, I think that there's a lot of I think that there is a self-consciousness about like even in the macrocosm about like, oh, people are miserable. I think what's what's missing is and again, this is like orthodoxy. The church was the only thing that I had encountered where there was even any thought that like, oh, there's an antidote to your misery. <laughs> like there's an antidote to misery and it's a it's a person and it's christ mm -hmm. and at, outside of the church there isn't like these people they have ideologies they have things that they live for they have all these things where they're like oh this is me this is my identity and you look like you say the feminism they've got all these things that they've got and you're like every single one of those every person who's hardcore about them is miserable yeah why on earth do you want to adopt all of those things as your identity and you can't find a single person who who is happy and who is I any think, of the not forget well, about happy well, who's just not miserable I, I would just say this too because what i found consistently and this is tough right because we all know this but what i found consistently is you know we can even just let some people off the hook and let's take it out of the realm of feminism um and it's just you know it's one trick pony, I get it, but just remember that we we just we don't want God, and the Holy Spirit comes to us and teaches us how to slowly begin to acclimate ourselves to God. It's it's Adam, right? Adam, Adam, where are thou? You know, where are you, Adam? Right? We're we're always running from Adam, and the reason why I'm saying like this is just again to be charitable. These people, it's like they're miserable, but you gotta always understand like these are this 
this this type of person who's struggling with this, this is the type of person who they think that when you say to them something to the effect of maybe you should really um maybe maybe you need to be spending a little bit more time seeking God in some things, they'll get offended. Yeah. You know, these are people who the, they can't read elders and fathers. They literally can't read them because they think that they're just preaching hate because they're saying, Hey, we're sinners. These are people who this happens to a lot of people. And, and uh, we, I can be charitable and say, Oh, they suffered some sort of trauma because of their dads or I don't know, whatever, but they, they can't like, Oh, it's just, why is orthodoxy always talking about, I'm just a worm. I'm just a worm. Where's the good times, orthodoxy? You know, like, that's a thing for a lot of people. For a lot of people. And, and I think it's important to kind of say that because, again, um, if we act like we all haven't had that, that moment where we kind of want to, come on, God, you know, the Peter moment. You know yeah. I love you. Why are you saying that again? We all have that moment like Peter, right? But the thing is, these people, they, they get stuck there. They don't get to the third, do you love me? They get stuck at the first one. The first time Christ says, hey, Jimmy, do you love me? And they just, Jimmy can't handle it. He's like, I'm out of here. Or or Joni in this case. You know, Lord says, Joni, do you love me? Ah! You know, it's like. I, I think. To that point, and again, this is just, I think the millennial perspective on all of this, speaking purely from whatever point of view I have, which I don't know what that is, but I think it's, um, I've seen recently, they, there's an obsession with longing, and not the bishop, but like longing. <laughs> yeah. da, da, da. Um, that they are far more comfortable again alcoholic here um of of longing for something better without doing anything to to do it but they they like they're constantly you know like okay so it would be like a person driving and be like man 32 i don't have a family you know i don't have anything man i would love that but take one day of responsibility of the means to run the in and out of a household and a family. And they're out. They're like, man, no, I'm longing for that single life. Now, you know, it's this longing for whatever. And I think my generation especially is like enraptured in longing for things, longing for the past, longing for the future, longing for anything other than where they're supposed to be, because you know, who is right where you are what you're doing and when you're doing it like you know who's there it's christ and it's like when i'm struggling in prayer a lot of times it's because i keep doing this like mm -hmm. christ is standing right here mm -hmm. and i just keep like wow i should really do something about the drapes in here it's about time i got all those cobwebs up there in that corner and the whole time like christ keeps gently moving my hand back i'm like knock knock it off knock it off and like i've you know i've got the stuff over here and then being right here that's where he is and it's like he is the one who is not who will be or who it or who was it's who is it's right here and like that longing constantly takes you out of that moment and takes you to another fantasy world i guess i don't know i can't i, I can't speak to that but i know that the the thing that i have continued to struggle with when i especially when i work with people about my age is this whole symphony or this whole saga they'll write about the way things should have gone about the way you know whatever 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 and it's like all this is just a distraction i guess to not even have to answer that first do you love me it's like well what have you done for me lately it's like do you love me well what have you done for me lately my life is miserable you know it's all it it should be so much better and it's like at that point there's really nothing to do you know you've already lost so you're already down on the ground and you're refusing to get up. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Cyprian, you really look like you had something you wanted to say. Well, it's the, it's demoralization. It's really what it is. Like people are demoral. Like 
it's weird because it's almost as though the hallmark of demoralization is that you have a like hyper inflated uh, fantasy and imaginary life that you're like living instead of in even the present, maybe sometimes in the past, maybe in the future, but it's like it's a fantasy life. Yeah. It's a life of what should have been. Or a life of what should be, as opposed to a life of what is, because as you say, like Christ is what is. And it, it does seem to me to go back to this idea of like, well, you know, it's because it comes from somebody saying, well, there should be, there should be uh, female deacons. And it's like, no, there aren't female deacons. That's no, there should be. And it's like, yeah, no, 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 there great. are not female deacons. Stop. Yeah. yeah, that's a great, that's a great insight, actually. Um Man, that's actually a really good insight, Zubrin. Because I, I, like for me, this is just me, but my litmus is always, okay, how does this play out when someone says something? It's like, how does this play out like in the day-to-day life? And the day-to-day life, you know, it's like the people who do, the the people who are really sick are the ones who are just not accepting reality, right? Um, and that, that's basically what you're talking about is that on a, on a macro scale, you know, in regards of they project their inability to face the reality of life on the structures of history or the church, or does that, you, you, does that make sense how I'm framing that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. That's exactly what I'm saying. And, no, and it, it has to be. Mental illness. It's that mental illness of always needing to project externals to. By the way, cornerstone of feminism. I'm just going to say, just just looked into it. I didn't have to do a whole thing on it for school. I was talking to my father about this. It's like literally it's one of the key concepts that you're supposed to work with social work. Externalize your problems. Somebody else's fault. Yeah, it's a cornerstone. It's absolutely like if there were a bullet point of the basic tenant tenements uh, or tenants of um, it's feminism is it's the oppressive system. It's the patriarchy. It's your husband. It's, it's, you know, it is, the point is to take the pressure out of yourself and externalize it. You have to, it's like. Wait, this is like actually articulated in feminist, like thought and ideology. Well, there's no quicker way to failure. Like there's no quicker way to failure than to externalize your problems and say that nothing is your fault. Like if you want to fail at something, that's the, that's it. Just do that. And you're automatically, you automatically fail. You cannot succeed. It's a war on women. It's a, it's a war on women to get everybody to fail you know it's 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 literally written in the code you you have to you have to accept that so if if that's and like and that's the thing i want to ask some people that are really into it It, and i'm not trying to rag on feminism you know it it is what it is it's like i'm okay sure but if like um you know like if i were talking to 18 year old jimmy um and jimmy's oh yeah i'm a rampant you know I'm i'm a i'm a huge feminist it's like okay what are some of the tenets of feminism? And you say, okay, well, okay, I'm like, well, what you're talking about is equal rights. Those are two very different things. We're talking about two very separate things. And when you talk about feminism, do you believe this and this and this and this? And, you know, Jimmy might say yes or whatever, but, you know, it's like, okay, what you're espousing is, again, this same thing everybody does. You read a headline and you decide that you're informed. And it's like, okay, well, sure, that's fine. But you don't necessarily know what you're talking about. I mean, ask me how I know. I almost never know what I'm talking about. So (laughs) I think that's apparent. We're 90 episodes in. I think people like someone said it. I've always pictured it like this. His father's at the top of the mountain. Cyprian's at the middle of the mountain. and I'm at the bottom of the mountain. Father's passing. It's going to Cyprian. Cyprian's going to me. Somebody said to me, it's like, no. Like father's at the top of the mountain, Cyprian's at the bottom of the mountain, and you're like the tour guide through the city. You're like, like kind of walking around, like being like, I'm the guy who like sells t-shirts or something because it's like, and I was like, actually, that's much better because it's like, yeah, there's wisdom coming down. But it's like, yeah, that's great. But you're really going to want to pay attention that trash day is on Tuesday. Like be sure and get your trash out on Tuesday. Oh! <laughs> don't go to that Italian restaurant down there. It's awful. My wife and I got food poisoning one time. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, that for me is like, I was like, actually, that's much more. And um, hilarious. Yeah. And then we found out 
that the South African gay Satanist is anti Father Turbo. Andrew Tate is anti Cyprian. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tim Who's you? Tim Pool. Tim Pool Tim is Pool. anti you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. That's absolutely right. That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, Somebody yeah. said that, I agree. and I was just like, my eyes like widened, and I was kind of like in shock for a second. I was like, it's so obvious. It was been, <laughs> yeah. he's been there the whole time. So the whole time. So the whole time. The whole time. It's right so obvious. That's yeah. So it was obvious. good. It was good. It was like <laughs> that's great. It was like my, in my house the whole time. He's been here the whole time. <laughs> I never knew. <laughs> But anyway, gentlemen, we're it's a of... regular M. Night Shyamalan movie right there. It's an M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> movie. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. Um, OK, so, gentlemen, we're coming up at two hours. We should yes, probably. Um, but thank everyone for thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, OK, what do we do here? Uh, so every time we mention music, it goes on a playlist. Royal Path podcast playlist. It's on Apple mm -hmm. Music and Spotify, I think. Mm -hmm. Um. So then we also have a merch store. We don't see any of that money. Uh, that either goes to a, the parish or to the people who make the music. Uh, no, the merch. The merch. The, the merch. Yeah. What did I say? Oh, the make, make the music. Sorry. Um, Father, what? The, what? Uh, put Hold it on. Thread. Um, Father's Wait, you put it in a you, you put something in the thread? Okay. Yeah, wanna... Keep going, Andrew. Keep going. Okay, sorry, going, yeah. But... I just want to call attention to it. Um then also Skull of Coffee. Uh link Ooh. in the um link in the description. Uh Skull of Coffee, uh made in house uh Mount Tabor, you know, blah blah blah. I think you guys have heard the skill before. Please support it. It's wonderful coffee. Just found out I'm allergic to coffee. So what? Um, how is that alert to what part of the coffee are you allergic? I don't know, but it's a common thing. Uh, I get confused. My cognitive functions seem to decrease and my nostrils dry out. Turns out it's totally a thing. It makes air very hot. It's like sitting in a super dry room. It's not, I'm not going to the hospital, but it's uncomfortable. But like every time I drink it, it does the same thing to me. I just get so like, you, so you have reduced cognitive function from coffee. I it's the same thing happens to me when I eat avocado. So when oh, I oh yeah avocado, yeah 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 my stomach okay. really hurts I start to feel confused and then when I eat really bad pasta my right ear gets really hot and I get confused I got a lot what of makes pasta bad food. what makes pasta bad cheap cheap what makes gross it bad, like off brand pasta that's full of huh. whatever ground up bugs or whatever I I don't know what's in there but um I've just had it enough times where I'm like this is the eat, thing eat see bugs. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. You know, I'm going into the new Crazy. new world, kicking and screaming. So, um, so also, uh, what else? Hold um, on, I'm pulling this thing up. Keep going, Andrew. No, no Keep you're going, fine. Andrew. Because uh, oh, if you want to contact us, please reach Hold out. On. Contact at royalpath.network. Uh, we will have to find someone to take it over because someone is about to go on oh uh, paternity leave, and then uh, you can also reach out to me at Andrew at royalpath.network. Oh, that's right. Um, and I think that that's it. I think that that's all that we talked about. And Cyprian's working for like, like a madman to pull up something. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, you guys got me like this. Is, okay. Oh yes, this is perfect. But let me, um, let me open this in a new window here. Open a new window. So what he's trying to open up is I just want to, right. I mentioned a couple. What I'm of trying to do is pull up an icon. I think he's a little bit behind on the lag. So I, I mentioned uh, a couple weeks yep. ago that I'm um, going to have some um, prints mm. coming out. And so this is the first one um, that's going to be coming out. Um, and this is going to be sold by the convent here, the convent of the Mother of God. And it's this um, icon uh, of St. Can you Mary. see it? Is it? Did it come up? Yeah. yeah. It came up. Um, me, and so this is going to be at the website, the Confident of the Mother of God website, um, and the prints will be going live on uh, the 15th, and it'll be uh, 35 plus shipping for a 4 by 6 and 50 for an 8 by 10 Beautiful metallic canvas paper prints, um, and they're all um, put out and produced by the convent. Um, the St. Mary of Egypt icon is going to be the first one. Um, but others are coming out. 
um, Revelation 19 icon, Last Supper icon, um, all that I've painted, and all the proceeds go to help the nuns uh, to support them. Also, too, um, if you if you want to, you can uh, kind of double things up. Pentecost is coming up. And so when you go to the website, you can order, you know, the baptismal robe and just they also have bibs that they're putting out for uh, bibs are great. The bibs well. are great. Um, so baptismal babe, baptismal bibs for the babies. Um, so check out all that the nuns are doing there. Um, but if you want a robe, an, an icon, you're going to need to email um, baptismal robes at St. Mary of Egypt.net. So that way you don't have to pay double shipping. That's baptismal mm. robes at St. Mary of Egypt.net. But other than that, go to um, the St. Mary of Egypt uh, website, click on the, the Convent of the Mother of God link. And then from there, you'll see the um, it'll lead all to the, um, the icon. So, yeah, please, you know, check it out. Um, it's incredible. And, yeah, thank, thank God. It's beautiful, yeah. There's going to be more coming out. Um, and I really hope that people um, are blessed by them, they enjoy them, and that they can support the nuns here in Kansas City. So, yeah. Very awesome. handsome little boy as a model, by the way, for the bib. Very, very handsome little, <laughs> little tyke. I'll just say that. Um, so, we'll put links in there too. Yeah, I'll, we'll have. Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The links. Will, the, I'll, I'll put them at the top of the description for for that actually, because I think a lot of people will be interested. Yeah. So it's please perfect. keep an eye out. There's there's going to be a whole bunch of more. There's a Saint Zania icon coming. Mm -hmm. awesome. um, like I said, there's there's just a bunch more uh, softener of evil hearts Ooh. icon. These are all these things. are all the great. These are all the hits. Yeah, Terror of Demons this... icon. Terror of Demons oh. icon is coming. So. Just don't let you know our boy Jordan Peterson anywhere near him. Turn him into like a <laughs> or his jacket. He'll yeah. put him on a jacket. <laughs> jacket. Yeah. Oh man! All right, <laughs> we got Jimmy oh, and Jordan Peterson in. We got Jordan like <laughs> twice this episode. So, okay, gentlemen. Um, I genuinely do think that's it. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for. Okay. Yeah. Christ is risen. And truth is risen. Thank truth you. Is. And thank you for having a good night. Uh, bye bye.